I want to preface this episode, episode eight, with some information. Um, I This is an episode that was a coordinating of schedules of two busy professional women and three very busy youth. Grace, an incoming freshman to Duke University that's opting for a gap year to pursue volunteer work. A senior Emory fully invested in college applications and pursuit of her acting career. And then junior Wyatt, working at McDonald's, the drum major of the high school band, and fully invested in informing others on why voting is imperative at all levels, local, state, and national. You can imagine it took us a while to get this coordinated. The night we finally were able to coordinate and meet together in Zoom for the recording was the same night the shooting of Jacob Blake. As said before, this episode and its recordings were planned many weeks in advance. We're in no way wanting to use this recent event as a way to promote the Bulldog Educator podcast. This particular episode is about the youth in this recording and the humanity, heart, and passion they share for being actively involved in creating a better world. We are dedicating this episode and to all of the lives that have been lost. We also hope that this episode will inspire another level of empathy, hearing the heart of these amazing students. Thank you for listening. Welcome. You're listening to the Bulldog Educator Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Kirsten Wilson. Thank you so much for listening. Music created for the Bulldog Educator is by David Galvez. Podcast platform is through anchor.fm. All right. So, um, so guys, I'm so glad I get to see your faces. Grace, uh, I hope and sounds like school is going amazing. And of course, Emery and, um, you know, we just, we're, we're back, right? Mm -hmm. We're back. Why you we're back? It's like, it we're back. Like, I didn't we're even back. Know that was a summer. That was not yeah. summer. Mm -mm. <laughs> I was and, like, hey, oh. that was probably the longest vacation you've ever not wanted to have, but mm -hmm. maybe no, enjoyed a lot. It's of. so weird because it felt so long, and then we got here, and it was like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> like, but it was <laughs> right. at the same time. It just felt like a long, like. Like so much stuff kept on happening. I was like, the way I imagined my senior, like after senior year summer, was nothing like this. It's like we had a pandemic mm -hmm. and then we had the fight for our lives to matter. And I was like, what is happening? This was supposed to be the <laughs> beach. Absolutely, to be absolutely. Oh. And it was it was a bit much. So I'll be honest with you. As soon as all of this started happening with the with the killing of George Floyd, Mr. Floyd, and it escalating the already present tensions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think someone, you know, in, in my circle said it best, and I've been seeing it all over Facebook. That's not a new thing. It's been happening mm -hmm. for a long yeah. time, but now some of these things are being videoed and they're being captured. And and people are angry and, and upset. And so I went through a myriad of emotions, right? So I started thinking more about my husband and when he would leave and you know would he come back alive you know would would my family members be safe and i thought about you guys when all of that popped off this summer and i thought how are our kids doing and in my capacity as a city leader and my heart as a mama i really wanted to ask y'all how you doing like how are you <laughs> feeling and so since i've got your attention now i want to start with that question how were you feeling at the beginning when things initially happened and when it escalated? Um, if you want to share with us, how were you feeling initially? And then how has that evolved, if at all, to where you are right now, um, you know, a few months later? So either one of you'd like to start. Wyatt, since I see your face, would you like to share? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, well, I think that, well, at first I was, it was kind of like a mix of emotions, honestly. Uh, I was kind of in that boat, and still am, of people not really caring. It felt like they put one thing on their Instagram story, and then they were done. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, um, and it was the case for a lot of people. Um, and so I was kind of, I was really mad about that. Because if you see my Instagram story, it is a never-ending cycle of <laughs> of posts about these types of things and um different issues that uh i try to advocate for a lot and but when it all when it happened 
I was just really angry, period. Like, it was just, that was the only emotion. And then I learned, I learned about Breonna Taylor after George Floyd. And her story just makes you sad. Like, there's, it makes you angry, but the way that it is, the way that that story happened, just, it makes you, you know, question, Mm -hmm. like, everything about our justice system, our policing system, you know, America's corrupt systems and out of whack systems that we obviously need to fix. And so really, as of right now, I feel, I feel like, I feel spirited. I Like, I feel like I'm ready to fight and I've been ready to fight and I've been fighting Constantly. Mm-hmm. I've been up and, you know, talking yeah. to people and trying to change the conversation, changing the vocabulary, because I think a lot of the vocabulary that we use was a, lo- a lot of the vocabulary we used before the Black Lives Matter movement took off this year um, mm-hmm. was not helpful and it wasn't correct. And so, you know, shifting conversations, shifting vocabulary, you know, just doing the most that I can to make people and to help people realize that the things that are happening are not okay Mm -hmm. and that we have a power with just our everyday going abouts and conversations and actions Mm -hmm. to help change these things and so really it's just been about going fighting pushing Mm -hmm. and just uh being as hopeful as i can Fantastic. Well, I think before I go to you, Grace, I want to give you a heads up that I'm coming to you next. But I think it's really important to also say that uh, you folks that are on the call, it's a mixture of women of color and allies. And Mm -hmm. and this this topic is I mean, this conversation is even much more broader than just, you know, the the social justice piece. Um, but it's also um, how we are able to convert that passion and that spirit into broader action. And so I now want to pivot that to Grace. And Grace, <laughs> when, when at the height of the summer, when everything was swirling around for you, how did you feel? The quote cool, unquote cool summer. Oh, I can't say worst summer ever. <laughs> the longest I, summer of your life. <laughs> I can't even exaggerate. Definitely worst summer ever. But I'd say like the I found out from Twitter because I had initially I had I like just downloaded Twitter and I had initially just downloaded it because like all the funny stuff is on Twitter. Like people just need their mind on Twitter. You know, I was like, um oh, here for the laughs. And then like my whole timeline is just like flooded. And there's like videos of this was this was I think it was like the the day after he had been murdered, uh, and you saw like the clips of buildings burning and fights breaking out, and then you read the articles about what happened, and then you see the video, you see the pictures, and it was just it was a sensory overload. And mm-hmm. even though this happened several times, like this has happened a lot of times, and we've seen you know black death like on video several times before but this one was just it was like the combination of just seeing the total chaos seeing this man being murdered and then just having to digest it all at one time plus a pandemic like i have never like wept so hard in my life that was my initial reaction just like i just could do nothing but just cry for like an hour and and just pray like i literally got to the point where I was just like I gotta get on my knees and literally pray and I was thinking like in that moment I was thinking like how many of my ancestors have had to pray the same prayer and cry these same tears like and we were supposed to be that generation that didn't have to experience that you know we're the desegregated generation you know it was supposed to be us who didn't have to experience that but here we are and here's all my friends and like this was the time where uh they were kind of like recruiting us for college so we all had like little group chats and stuff and there's always like the little the little small group chat so it's like they had like black yale black dude da, 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 da. and like seeing the people on there react to it and everybody was just having like the same moment and i was just thinking like we were robbed we were supposed to be at this point we were supposed to be at least a little bit better than this but obviously we're not there yet and it was just i just say completely devastating like i literally had to 
it took me like a week to kind of like recover because it's like it will send you into a mania especially being black it's like am i safe is my brother safe my brother was out of state on an internship knocking on doors for uh you know uh they'll send you on an internship where you like knock on doors sell products mm -hmm. like PR and I'm like you're knocking on doors in a different state we don't know if you're going to come back you know it's at the height of things if you knock on the wrong door you know my brother and I not come home like it was a lot of it was it was very overwhelming initially and that was when we were actually about to have the uh the Moralton protest but in my mind like I was in such a mania that I was like I was paranoid. I was like, what if I show up and I get killed and so-and-so gets killed and I'm responsible and blah, blah, blah. Like, but at a certain point I just had to go. And I'm very glad that the protest went well because I say like that was the beginning process of me getting to a point where I can be like, okay, this is what has happened. And this is what I can do to help it be better. Because the only way that like I can feel any hope or anything is to actually start doing action steps. So I'd say after the we had the protest in Morrison, and after that went well, um, that just really spurred me on to a better wave now. Grace, you know, we're covered, you know, eh, we're back on it. But and and now I'm at a point to where I can think straight and actually use, you know, the tools that I know that I have to, mm -hmm. you know actually fight for these causes and and do things that will actually have an impact because i don't like doing things where like i can't see a tangible impact or i can't see a an actual future result so yeah that's what i've been on right now and there's some big projects to come which i, can no. tell I can't tell y'all a lot of details right don't now. hit us with it right now we can't we I can't, can't take y'all the amazing I right can't. now like <laughs> i can even tell y'all my my college stuff right now like but trust me lots of information will be coming out soon i'm actually i can't tell you guys one thing i'm volunteering right now for uh senator joyce elliott's campaign yes this is an yes! 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 <laughs> and so, you know especially your beta people because uh they are doing it to where they have like official documents to where uh you volunteering for her campaign and like doing uh phone banks and stuff they'll train you virtually but all of that counts as volunteer hours it can count mm -hmm. as an internship it can go on your resume so yeah y'all get out and vote my homegirl joyce Elliott. yes <laughs> i have been trying yes. to get with her campaign for so long i just have not found the right time to like sign up yes. for everything i but... have to jump on it i did it literally mm -hmm. during my my uh my boss is a big joyce elliott supporter so she let me like uh she she starts her trainings at like one mm. and so she was like yes go 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 to the zoom call <laughs> oh, so, yes Woo! that is fantastic grace yeah. i'm so excited to hear that and i am hearing some themes about how you're feeling now as opposed mm -hmm. to the um the instant feeling that gut feeling that we all kind of experienced in different ways yeah. right coming from different backgrounds and different yeah. spaces in time um and so i i'm gonna bring those themes back up here in a little bit uh, but i want to see if if emory um wouldn't mind sharing with us how she felt when all of this occurred and and how she's evolved in in her emotional state with all these events yeah so um my initial reaction was probably a mixture of shame shock and helplessness mm -hmm. um i felt like like there was absolutely nothing i could do i didn't really know how to help the situation i was very ashamed of my like some of the, my family members how they reacted to it some of my friends seeing what they were saying about it um and i was ashamed that i couldn't do anything like and that i that i didn't know that all like all the stuff like i knew stuff was going on obviously i knew about the black lives matter movement but i i did not educate myself as much as i should have in that moment because when i saw all that i was extremely shocked and i was I, it sent me into this spiral of I don't want to say denial, but I was like, this can't, this can't be happening. This is not, 
like what this doesn't happen in America what are we talking about and I think a lot of people felt that way and that's why we saw some stuff online that was like very like misinformation and all that different things but then I saw friends like Grace and Wyatt and a bunch of my other friends who were really speaking out and thankfully like educating people like myself that did not know what was going on and after that I was really angry um and it was I think it was important not to not to put this on myself but I think this it was important for me to learn all that stuff because I made a really important character decision like for my development as a person um in that moment and I decided that I was going to be a lot more outspoken about my political beliefs and also my beliefs on basic human rights. I didn't know I had to do that, but <laughs> apparently so. Um, <laughs> and it was really hard at first because I've always kind of been um, like the good girl, if that makes sense. I've always been the person that agrees with everyone, mm -hmm. uh, very easy to get along with, doesn't really like to bring up, you know, controversial topics because I don't mm -hmm. want to get in trouble but I kind of decided, no, that's part of the problem. I'm part of the problem whenever everyone's like, oh, look at Emery. She's, she's so good because she's not talking about this stuff. You know, be like Emery, you know, keep your mouth shut, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I was part of the problem. And now that I've taken on a lot more responsibility for my actions and I've been able to go out and do things and I've been outspoken, I feel a lot better about myself. I don't have as mm -hmm. much of that shame anymore because I know that I'm doing everything I can, or, and there's more I can do, you know? There, I haven't done sure. everything I should, but there's, I feel a lot better now that I've taken action and I've been outspoken. And now my main concern is just like, all that stuff that I post on my Instagram story and social mm -hmm. media and stuff is just translating that into real life. Like, how am I implementing this, making sure I'm not just, you know, what is it, uh, what is it called, performative activism? Making yeah. sure I'm not <laughs> into that. Yeah. Educate the people, Emory. Educate them. Yeah. Um, so right. listen, I will be 100% honest with you guys. So um, the night of that uh, organized um, protest in Moralton, the first one, when I saw the diversity in that crowd, mm -hmm. I, I mean, diversity in age, diversity in color, we had all genders. For me, it was moving because I realized that, you know, we, and like I said that night, if our brothers and our sisters are hurting, you know, for, for the sake of humanity, basic, basic human, um, you know, a basic human emotion should be to care for one another. Um, and for me to see that diversity in the crowd, it was encouraging. And I was so glad to see you guys because I didn't have to wonder anymore about, obviously I didn't get to see everyone, but I had a chance to lay eyes on some of you and to, um, to see how you're feeling. And then that led to a conversation with some of you at City Hall. And so, you know, I'm, I'm here tonight as Jasmine Wilson. I'm here tonight as, um, you know, a, a, an elected official who cares about your voice. Uh, because at the end of the day, we are only as successful as we are in making connections and building relationships and moving ahead. Um, and when I say moving ahead, it's not just um, recognizing something, but it's also what each one of you have said tonight. It's taking action. And so, you know, you've got the social justice piece here, and then you've got all the other things that go on in our world. As young people, as young people, I want you to, uh, to tell us what you think there's, there's one thing, if there were one thing that people could do, in your opinion, to take action to drive change, what would that one thing be? Hmm. That's going to take some thought time. It's going to take some yeah. marination. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so marinate on that because we can save that one for the end. Um, yeah. But what I, what I really want to know, then let's throw it to, um, you know, one of the basic things that John Lewis has challenged us all with. So uh, for me, um, I've been watching all of these tributes to um to john lewis and i have been so moved and he he always said in, in some of his speeches that he shed some blood on that bridge right so that we could have the right to do many of the things that we do today these privileges that we have and one of the biggest ones that we have 
is uh, participating in elections. So tell me how you feel about voting, each one of you. What is your perspective on, on the vote? And do you feel like young people are doing it as much as they should? And then I'll share some, um, some light statistics with you. What's your opinion though, first blush? Well, I know my opinion straight off the bat on this one. Tell uh, it. <laughs> this, this year especially, honestly it's kind of making me nervous because there's more people like right now who are willing to vote we have enough stressors on people if they were ever going to vote then now is the time that they were going to vote however then you have the the aspect of the pandemic and then you have the aspect of uh everything that's going on with the u.s postal service and it's like i feel like a lot of people who finally you know have decided this is the time, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to vote. I'm going to be more politically active. I'm going to be more, you know, politically aware and it's potentially not even going to work. And I feel like that could be discouraging if, you know, you had a small tear on your mail-in ballot and it didn't get counted, you know what I'm saying? Or, or they threw yours out because, you know, you had a stray mark somewhere or the U.S. Postal Service didn't even get it there on time. I feel like that could be very uh, discouraging to these new voters, these fresh voters. But as far as uh, young voters go, speaking for my generation, I'm thinking that we're going to have a better voter turnout because I feel like Gen, Gen Z is a lot different than millennials and like previous generations of young people because there's there's a lot more especially now i didn't see it until like just during this pandemic but a lot of the a lot of the push on as important political you know subjects and and the people who are on the front lines making information and you know getting stuff out about this stuff is are people from our generation are people who are just turning 18 or or 19 or people who aren't able to vote yet so i'm very optimistic about um young voters in the future and also uh millennials too who are like 27 26 because i feel like they feel the pressure from our generation we're so fed up we're like we see all these things and we're like well our generation you know we've been desegregated our whole life this doesn't make sense to us so <laughs> i feel like they're feeling the pressure from us actually wanting to take action they're like well now they're making us look bad so we need to get out of vote so i'm i'm optimistic about people wanting to get out and vote more and people having more initiative to get out and vote but with the coronavirus and the u.s postal service i am trying to find like a loophole because i'm like there's 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 several ways to skin a cat it can't just be the u.s postal service or bus there has to be another way that you know we get mm -hmm. elderly people's vote in we get young people's vote in in a, a safe and manner so that's the that's the hurdle right now but other than that i'm i'm pretty optimistic about this year and future years we have to make sure this momentum stays up but i feel like it could, it could be something that's potentially long term. Absolutely. All right. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that I've heard mentioned uh, over and over again with um, the convention last week, convention going on this week, and just all over um, the news, everyone is encouraged not to wait to the last minute to request those absentee ba ballots for that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's definitely one of the things that, you know, for all of us being able to encourage people to do that is really going to um, yeah. hopefully help. But I do, I do un completely understand, you know, I've even heard some people say things like, well, I was ready to vote, but will they get my ballot? Um, so then let me uh, switch gears over to Emery. Any thoughts, Wyatt, anything you'd like to add to that? Anything different than what Grace has shared? Would you like to go, Emery? Because I, I got it if you, if you want to go. Yeah, I know Wyatt knows a lot about all of this, so I'm going to I'm gonna push it to him because he, he's where I get my information from. Most of the time. <laughs> Love it. Hit us with it, Wyatt. Okay, so first, I got a couple of things. Oh, Grace yeeted out. It's fine. She'll be back. Um, <laughs> a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, if you're voting by mail, election day is October 20th. Election day is October 20th. The U.S. Postal Service has said that they will treat, you know, 
male as first pre- first class male, but we don't have that in writing. We don't have that as a law yet. And so we have to have that 14 day um, time frame between an election and when ballots can be mailed in. If your ballot is not mailed in by October 20th, there's a high chance that it will not be counted. And so, um, you know, request those absentee ballots now and get your vote out by October 20th if you want to vote by mail. I think um, shifting to um, away from that into like the younger generation, I've had more people, more young people um, come to me asking about how I vote, where do I register, what do I do, where do I go, like all these different types of things. Amberly keeps coming to me for her boyfriend and is like, you know, he lives here. Where does he go? How does he register? What district is he in? Who is he going to vote for? All these different things. And so I think it's um, encouraging to really see that. I say all the time on my Instagram, if you have any questions about voting, please come to me because I will tell you so quick where to go, what to do, how to register. Like, come on, we got to, we got to get it out there. That's Um, outstanding. We need that spirit. How, mm -hmm. how can we infect people with that sort of spirit to want to, um, to educate more and to get people Mm -hmm. more inspired to participate in the process? How can we do it um, in your generation or for your generation? I think that, I think that our generation is more aware of the fact that not every candidate is perfect. Mm -hmm. And so I had this conversation with somebody the other day and they said, you know, the Biden Harris ticket is good, but it's not what I wanted and it's not what I like. And I don't feel comfortable voting for either ticket, the Trump Pence or the Kamala Biden. And, you know, I explained to them, voting is not a one way stop. It is public transit. You got to get on at some point and then you Mm -hmm. go and then you get off. You got to take another, you know, you got to take the J downtown (laughs) and then you got to take the the G line uptown. You talk like a metro rider for real. You got to, you got to. Right. It's it's public transit. You got to. Oh, she left again. (laughs) Um, but it's not voting is not a one way ticket. There's a reason why the founding fathers decided that representatives have two years in office, senators only have four, and presidents only have four. Mm-hmm. There's a reason for that, and it's to you know ensure that we have a voice in who actually represents us. And so I think when when voters and young people realize that we have that power, we don't have to just say, oh, you know. These are the people that are in office. Nah, got to go. Like, we yeah. have the opportunity. You know, we don't have to have French Hill as, an, as a representative. People in the sec, uh, third district don't have to have Steve Womack as a representative. You know, there's so many down ballot. Inc- I think talking about down ballot incumbents also is a really strong you know, message. Like, you know, you may not feel comfortable voting for Biden and Harris. Okay. Think about where you live, Joyce Elliott, if you live in the first district, you know, think about Joyce Elliott, think about Jasmine Wilson on the Democratic ticket for for the uh, third ward? Is it third ward? Yes. Third ward's <laughs> first, second position. Third, you know, yes. think about her. Okay. I'll, I'll study up. I got up. it down to a science. <laughs> Let me tell you who's informed tonight. <laughs> I'm getting it. I'm getting right. it. Okay. okay. You know, and f- voting in state um, state, uh, state elections, your state representative, your state senator. You know, I didn't even know we had somebody running against Rick Beck for the longest. And I saw a sign on the side of the road. And I said, oh, we got to go. <laughs> we got to we gotta go. And so, you know. <laughs> just really making sure that we know that elections isn't just the presidency. And so um, I think that that's all important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think you hit the nail on the head, Wyatt. And I I think for for me anyway, in terms of um, people realizing that, you know, it's not just uh, the presidential election that matters. It's everything that goes down. Because when you Mm. think about um, the state level, it, a lot of the uh, education decisions are made 
at that level. And so it's important to make sure that you research candidates and, and know who you're voting for and don't just check the boxes. You make an informed decision. So pivot to this. Um, I found it very interesting when you, some of you guys told me that the way that you learn about um, like local elections and you know th the things that happen at a micro level is from TikTok. I just, I died. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> yes. And after you said that, guess who was posting more on TikTok about um, just little things like talking about the deadlines for early voting and all that good stuff? Because I thought, well, hey, if they're out there and if they're looking for this stuff on TikTok, I want to be doing my part. Um, what are some other ways that you guys are getting information? What are the vehicles that we need to be using? Instagram. That's where I've gotten most of my well, personally I'm finally using Google. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Google. <laughs> you said what, Emory? I was just saying Instagram is like where I've found most of my information, like going through people's stories and I, I see like something on the story and I'm like, hold up, wait, what? <laughs> and I click on it and then I read through the post or I go to the link. Yeah. That that kind of thing is really how I found most of my information. Mm. I think well, that yeah, reaching the out digital graphics really helps me. The digital reaching graphics out, really help, you said? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Reaching out to different young people really is what I do. Like, you know, not to brag, but people come to me <laughs> to some things, you know. I think it's important to say self-informed so you can inform other people. So that's what I try to do at least. Right. That's how you become world changers. And, mm. and honestly, um, when I listen to you guys talk, I think, gosh, we're putting some good people out into this world. Mamas and daddies <laughs> are good. And then you folks, you have, you've gone to, um, I mean, for me, watching Grace, watching Emory, watching you, Wyatt, I realized that you've taken on ownership of, of good, becoming a good citizen. So it's not enough just to, you know, be a good human, but you care about the people around you. You care about your, you know, your local government and you're making a change. You're making a difference um, at a very high level. And so I'm just, I'm inspired by you. All right. So yes, you can tell everybody that I'm a fan. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I got the information oh. um, that I really, oh, correct. was that a lay reaction? Yes, I'm a fan. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, you know, I, I said something about the, um, you know, the voter stats and typically I think it's you, Wyatt, probably know this even better than me. You know, in the 2012, 2016 election, there was an age group that outvoted everybody and that was 65 and up. And so, you know, we typically have very small increases within, you know, that 18 to 24 um, age bracket. And so it is important that we, you know, take note of the things that you guys have said, you know, how, how can we mobilize people? How can we reach out to them and, and make sure that they're aware? And those pieces of information, like what you shared, October 20th, you know, people need to have things in, in motion by then. Um, so now the floor is yours. Is there a topic or a, something that I didn't cover with you guys that you were really hoping to chat about on this call or on this, on this chat? Okay, my know. call just dropped. Oh. It keeps dropping because I'm on that country vibe. Mm -hmm. She on that country vibe. Are you are you at your home in the country? I have a home in the country on my road. Bless <laughs> your heart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trapped. I bet. Well, so let me position it this way. Let me position it this way. So imagine you have the ear of your leaders, the ones who are making the decisions, um, you know, at, at the city and even let's even say the, the state level. And if you could tell them one thing that you really feel like before, before they go to bed tonight, what do they have to know? What's that one thing that you've got to get off your chest you need to share with those need, leaders since you have their ear? We need to reform education. Mm, okay, tell us what that means to you. Well, I'm thinking specifically like history, uh, but education in general, getting teachers of color in all different school districts. I mean, 
realistically in a perfect world the teachers that are in a community should reflect the diversity in that community but we're not seeing that at all and mm -hmm. having teachers of color is so important not only for black kids or other kids of color but also for white kids because <laughs> Seeing that and, and developing those relationships, that's how we get empathy. That's how we fight indifference because I feel like indifference is one of the biggest things. It's not, it's not the people who are, you know, we, we think of as bigoted. It's not, it's not those people. It is those people. We, we, gotta, we gotta help those people too. They are a problem. <laughs> but the biggest problem is people who are just indifferent. They could care less. It doesn't affect them. So why should they care? And mm -hmm. those are the people that we gotta, we gotta get them involved and we gotta get them you know, educated because once they know and once they have those relationships, they're gonna care. Because I don't see how they couldn't care. You know, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't see how people, if they know these things, I don't see how they can just sit there and not do anything or not vote or you, you know. Yes. And so, if we can in education, in public education, if we can get kids knowing about these important movements, learning about the civil rights movement beyond the 1960s, beyond Martin Luther King, if we can educate kids on what's going on now then we have a better setup for the future absolutely that's what ah, and that's so true because i i <laughs> always wish there was more relevant information mm. i feel like that's part of the reason why it's it's harder for certain students to really pay attention in class because it's like we'll learn about history but then our teacher will fail to like connect it with why mm. is it important that we know about this today you know what i'm saying and that's what's the part because it's like okay you're teaching me about uh, World War One, you know, what's that got to do with me? You know, child, we're, <laughs> we're in 2020. So it's like, I feel like there's a, a disconnect there. And also the fact that like literally this year, I'm, I'm teaching myself all of these things. I'm having to teach myself financial literacy. Literally didn't write a check until this year. I didn't even know I had to spell out the little words of the cents in the dollars. Child, I, you got to sign the back of checks. Y'all know that? You have to sign the back or they won't take it. Don't like, feel bad, Grace. Feel bad. Do not feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I'm just like, it's, it's now that once you, once you graduate, like once you, when I was in school, I was like, you know what? I might use some of this information. But once you graduate and you like are 18 and you're adults and it's like, all of these new things are thrown at you, you realize I learned things in school, but I did not learn nearly anything that would actually relevantly <laughs> help me in my, in, my, in my real life, you know what I'm saying? And while I'm in school, you know, I'm a big academic. I love learning, even if, you know, it has nothing to do with my future career, but gosh darn, you know what I'm saying? I wish I learned about, you know, petitioning public elections why am i learning mm -hmm. this stuff on tiktok and mm -hmm. like i had this dream <laughs> i had this dream and i was like i had a dream that i was i think i was an english teacher and i took like every friday out to like teach kids relevant you know like okay yes we were learning about punctuation but today we're gonna learn about writing a check today we're gonna learn about a roth ira you know mm. what i'm saying like that nice. stuff that I, yes this is something like i just i just really wish but the thing is our teachers are hard pressed to get this curriculum out we're not giving them flexibility we're not giving them money like for real mm -hmm. we, the, the the people who are building our citizens and we got them out here oh living on what uh oh, mm -hmm. very ghetto very ghetto if you ask me. <laughs> so that's my spiel i feel like if if we could find a way to connect how we're educating kids and and help them connect that hey this is relevant in your real life and not just like hey if you want to become a marine biologist this might be helpful but for everybody else you better you know you <laughs> still gotta get the A to get to college you know what I'm saying I feel like if, if we could somehow connect it and teach our citizens you know information that will help them go out and be more productive in society I feel like that's going to benefit everybody. And I, I know me, me and uh, Mr. Parks actually got into a debate about this because I was like, there should be a mandatory like course uh, senior year. You know how they do uh, economics used to be freshman year. And child, mm -hmm. we didn't learn anything very much. <laughs> <laughs> like, because 
it's like you're your kid. I don't know how I can care and I don't know how I can retain this information for four years until it's relevant. Mm -hmm. But it's like if there was a course that would actually teach these things, he was like, no, because our education system is supposed to build you to be learners. Mm -hmm. And while that is true for the people who aren't inherently going to get to, okay, I had to use my brain to learn calculus. Now I can use my brain to learn, you know, like look up tools to figure out my financial life, my, uh, my voting life, et cetera, et cetera. It'd be Mm -hmm. so much more helpful if we could place those tools in people's hands, because, you know, when you're doing good with your money, I can do good with my money because you're spending your money effectively. You could go shop at my business, baby. The economy's (laughs) thriving. You know, you're not struggling, love. Like that's, that's my spiel about education. I love, love, love education. Cannot tell you I don't love education. I'm definitely a nerd, definitely that straight A kid, but I do feel like there is a disconnect when it comes to like relevant material. But I love what you said about, um, about the more diverse teachers, because yes, when I'm telling you, Miss Kettle and Miss Wilson came to school, like literally, I was like, I can go out happy now. Like I can retire, you know, happily because I know, you know, my little babies who are still there, you know, have some support system. And, and not that like your white teachers can't be a support system because, you know, Mr. Parks is a support system. Love him to death. But it's like diversity is definitely necessary. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's my spiel, guys. That's my spiel. <laughs> so I'm not a crybaby at all, but you got me that day. Um, <laughs> When you shared that story at City Hall, um, and I and, and I had always known, I'd always preached this in the workplace. So when I, you guys know that I come from a corporate um, background, and mm-hmm. of course prior to that, I did work in higher education. And so you know, I I have known a world where there weren't very many people who looked like me. However, we were always serving a community, our businesses that were diverse. And so I would always preach, it's important to reflect the community that you serve. And so to hear you guys say that and to hear you say that, um, it's Paul, I I just, I remember, I just, I remembered um, how I felt when I had um, my first black supervisor and she was a woman and she was strong and just, and, and that's not to say that I didn't appreciate all of the other ones that I had had, but there right. was something special about being able to, to learn from her and to understand her struggles that she had mm-hmm. to speak from someone who may not look like her. And so, um, you know, this has really been invigorating for me. Now, I want to make sure I didn't leave anybody out. So, Wyatt, what's your one thing? Well, if I think, I- um, well, going back to that, uh, what Grace said about the high school teaches you to be a learner. Uh, high school shouldn't only teach you to be a learner if you're not going to make college available to everybody. But that's just my Ooh, two yeah. cents. Um, <laughs> um, I think that if there was one thing that I could tell elected officials about, you know, about our generation, about, you know, what young people want, I think that, I think, I don't think there's just one thing. I think that young people are looking for an equitable and just future. We are looking for climate justice. We are looking for economic justice. We are looking for a justice system that works for everybody and does its correct job. We are looking for, you know, protections for LGBTQ people who have who are able to have health care. We're looking for health care. You know, we are and we're looking at you. We are going to be the next generation of voters and po- mm-hmm. and most definitely the next generation of elected officials. And mm-hmm. if you don't think that, you know, we will campaign hard against you or vote you out, you're mistaken. Mm-hmm. And that may sound very harsh, but that's just the sad re- that's just the hard truth. Mm-hmm. And I think that if if that was if there was one thing that I could tell elected officials, it's that you're 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 not you know you, the people are your boss the people got you in here the people are going to decide if you're doing the correct job or not and eventually and soon and now you know the young people are the people and whew, time's a ticking <laughs> <laughs>
Well, what, I didn't know that was the question we were answering. I was just thinking back <laughs> over every. <laughs> Because my call no, dropped every did time. Did you have another me. one? Yes. Right. The, I, I had thought on the question that you gave okay. earlier. Okay. And I would say if there was one thing that, like, I could make happen to make, you know, the, you know, society better and everything, is I would say teach effective communication. And mm-hmm. especially in our generation, we've seen how effective that has been in our generation. Like, we know how to communicate to each other through TikTok, through, like, infographics on Instagram we know what's digestible what's you know and 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 especially 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 for people on the other side of the ropes I feel like a lot of times you know people are like oh my gosh you're a Trump supporter throw up in my mouth but (laughs) and 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 while that that, that's a tempting first reaction for many people it's like I have to step back and think okay why do you think that way who were you raised by? What situations did you grow up with? Did you, were you around a diverse amount of people? Are everybody around you Trump supporters? Are you a bandwagon? Are there actually things that you feel like you align with him with? Are you misinformed on some certain things? You know what I'm saying? There's there's so many different aspects. Like, and and the only reason I started thinking this way is because I forgot his name, but there's um a black man who's a reporter. And he kind of like catfished the KKK Grand Wizard to like meet with him and interview with him. And he went and he, he ended up going to like KKK rallies consistently. And just his presence there and his conversations, he managed to have civil and, and approach him and communicate with them effectively enough that several, several, I'm talking about like he, he hangs up each, he keeps their KKK robes in his, in his closet because, and he eventually turned the grand wizard uh, away from the KKK. And it's just effective communication and empathy. You have to have empathy for people who are even at the other side of the road. And even when that's so difficult, it's like you're standing with an AR-15 you literally want to take my life, but it's like, that is not normal human behavior. And as mm-hmm. much as, you know, it's, it's well studied, uh, you know, the tragedy of how slavery and Jim Crow has affected, you know, the, the minds and, you know, how it's traumatized the Black community, but we rarely see how it has traumatized the white community, especially, and mm-hmm. you're seeing reflections of it now through, like like what Emery said, how she felt guilty uh, that she knows she wasn't doing more, and you know what I'm saying. Like it it aff- it, it has affected us all. It's it, it was a it's a traumatizing event, baby. We're <laughs> slavery is no joke, and it has mm-hmm. ramifications. And since we didn't take the time to actually address it when we could have, like during Reconstruction, we have to do that hard work now. And it's mm-hmm. it's hard and it's painful for everybody, but. I feel like if we see each other on both sides of the rope as human beings and be like, you know what, we may not see eye to eye, Mm -hmm. but I know deep down inside, you know what I'm saying? There's, you have something good about you. You know, you love your kids. You know what I'm saying? You got to have something good about you that we can connect on on a human level. And from there, you know, we can work to work things out. And even if we don't end up seeing, things the same way at the end we can at least be in a better position where we can both feel comfortable in our own spaces and help to build you know an inviting and you know safe and functioning society where you don't have to worry about getting killed when you go out or you know what I'm saying or small things like getting a job like your name preventing you from getting a job you know what I'm saying things like that so I feel like I would definitely push communication because it's it's so powerful it's so powerful i'm a big advocate for communication whoop, whoop. and that's how <laughs> <I feel. laughs> and you do it well i so for anyone who's listening today i think that if you've listened to this entire podcast you feel like um with folks like this in the world we're going to be in great hands and for me um i think that um you've all come across uh, time and time again, the, the same things. It's, you know, I, I think the piece about communication, I'd like to come back to that one and saying that at the beginning of the summer, when we, when we started this conversation, we talked about how we felt when things kind of kicked off this summer. Um, and that evolved from an emotional kind of experience to 
uh, inspiring action and inspiring um, what can I do and how can I get other people to help me do it. And that piece about communication being so vital that um, you guys, not only are you doing it well, but you are using that communication to bridge gaps. And I'm just, uh, I'm just thankful I have a chance to facilitate this conversation because you guys have enlightened me and I think you're going to enlighten a lot of people. Yes. So anything else you'd like to share? Yes, actually, piggybacking on what Miss Wilson Emery's mom, Miss Wilson, said about your mom, Miss Wilson, other Miss Wilson. <laughs> yes, Miss Verna is amazing. Just to let y'all know, FYI, podcast people, Miss Wilson, Jasmine Wilson's mom took care of my grandmother. She is a wise beautiful beautiful soul and she was her caregiver her her last caregiver before she passed away and i love her to death she's definitely an amazing woman do not let age prevent you from listening to people especially i mean your your older people are literally smarter what are you doing they're they treasures yes and they are treasures and, and they've walked this road before us and and what I love so much about my mom um, is, you know, she's wise and she is a fighter. So, you know, yes. she's, she's going through a personal battle right now. But I, I appreciate that so much, Grace. You know, she loved your grandmother so much. Um, yes. And so and she loves your whole family. So I, I tell you what she that for me is the picture of just a servant's heart. And and I think that if we can all do more of that, gosh, the world would be a better place. Thank you for listening to this particular episode of The Bulldog Educator. I want to reemphasize what Wyatt said, that we should self-inform so we can inform other people. Additionally, the rational plea that Grace made regarding the fact that change can be made if we just communicate on a human level and talk to each other how, talk to each other, is how we can overcome so many difficulties and differences. I hope that this episode has made a positive impact on you, and I hope that you'll return for more from the Bulldog Educator. Thank you for listening. <laughs>